thank you all for joining me today. Very excited, and I know you are, to talk about cross-examination and uh, how to beat up on those witnesses and win your case. That's what we're going to talk about how to do today. Uh, before I get underway, I just want to remind everybody that uh, if you have missed parts one, two, or three, being opening statements, jury selection, and direct examination, do not worry. You can find them at the Trial Academy's website or at my website, thementoresq.com, or listen to it uh, on the podcast of The Mentor ESQ, and you can still get CLE credits for all of those. Um, I also would like to mention that uh, the Academy uh, is obviously an organization very close and dear to me, having been a past president on the board, uh, and really it's a forum for me to meet so many fantastic lawyers, which I've been doing, uh, meeting many of you over the last several months and most of this year. Uh, if you're not a member and you're just enjoying the free CLEs, that's totally cool. We're happy to do it. Uh, but there are added benefits to being a member, and uh, I would encourage you to do so. If you find that it's worthwhile, you can even get a discount because you've already participated in the CLE. So if you're not a member yet, please consider joining us and uh, you can get involved on the boards, the associate boards. You can make policy, you can change things uh, and, um, and really make a difference. So please consider that. All right, cross-examination. Today we are going to talk about how to grill somebody. And as I always say, if you, um, you know, take away even just one tidbit uh, from from my lectures, then it's worth it, right? Something new. A lot of people have been reaching out to me and saying, well, I didn't necessarily learn anything new, but it reaffirmed that I'm doing things sort of the right way. So maybe that helps. Uh, and obviously some people have never been actually trained or learned the appropriate way to prepare to cross-examine a witness, uh, to digest a transcript, to prepare an outline, to impeach properly. So these are all things we're gonna talk about today. Um, at the very least, you'll be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your spouse or your child or your parent. Uh, and, and like my mother always likes to say, don't cross-examine me, Andrew. Um, so, uh, you know, take it for what it's worth. So let me give you an overview of what we're going to discuss today. Um, we're going to discuss, obviously, it's all about preparation. Prepare, prepare, prepare. You know, that's my mantra. And um, there's, it's so important to always prepare for every aspect, but in cross-examination at trial, it's all about preparation. You know, if you've ever observed a good cross-examination, um, it's not that the lawyer is so great, they're just coming up with all this stuff off the cuff during a trial. It's because there's a behind the scenes level of, level of preparation that goes into it, that allows you to look so smooth and sharp and quick-witted and prepared, okay? So we're gonna talk about having a plan. You always have to have a plan, whether it's as we talked about last month in direct examination, part three, or in cross-examination. What do you want from this witness? What's your plan? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how to digest a transcript. And by digesting a transcript, that's a phrase that I use, many people use. It's going through a pre-trial deposition transcript and highlighting the important stuff and making sure it's accessible and you know how to find it and how you use that to prepare and conduct a cross-examination. We talk about researching the witness who you're going to cross-exam, something that not everybody does, which I'm going to share a cool story with you about how effective it can be and make a difference in the whole case because uh, you can find some good stuff out these days. You're going to want to identify what sections or points uh, that you want to hit on when you cross-examine. We don't just get up in a trial and ask questions. We have a purpose. Uh, we want to get our apples. I talked about that in part three. You need, whether it's your element or something you're going to want to be able to argue to the jury or get into evidence for that purpose. Those are the apples you want to get out for your summation basket, all right? So those are going to be the sections or points to get those apples that you need for your case. We're going to talk about that. Talk about how to prepare the outline. You got to have an outline for cross-examining. It's not something you're going to read while you're doing it, but it's going to help you to get organized and uh, be a safety net if you lose your train of thought when you're in the mix or when you're taking a break to be able to look at. It. We'll talk about courtroom position. Uh, last time on part three in direct exam, we talked about where to stand. If you recall towards the back of the jury box, things get a little different on cross-examination. I'm going to share with you my thoughts on courtroom position when you are cross-examining a witness. Talk about how to control a witness. 
not all witnesses just sit there and give you nice answers. Sometimes they're long-winded. They don't answer your question. Um, they fight back, uh, especially uh, with expert witnesses. They're, they're a little bit more challenging to question. So you need to learn how to control a witness. And we'll talk about how to do that. And if they don't, you know, get in line and don't uh, respond appropriately, you're going to impeach them. That's the ultimate smackdown. And we're going to talk about how to impeach a witness in cross-examination. One of the most powerful moments that can happen uh, in the courtroom is when you, you know, pull out something from their prior testimony that contradicts what they've said to the jury uh, in real time. And then, you know, how to wrap it up, how to wrap up your cross-examination. So that's what we're going to touch on today. And um, uh, you think you probably know from my prior parts in this series and others, what I like to do is... You can feel free to drop any questions you have in the Q&A. And when the break happens for the sponsors uh, announcements and all of that, I'll take a quick look. If I have time within the first hour, I'll respond to those questions. If not, from 2 to 2.30, that's q and I'll go through them all. I try and address all of the questions. Don't be shy. Put all your questions in there. We'll get to it. And you will also get an extra half a credit if you stay on for from 2 to 2.30 for the extra half hour. And uh, this is a, you know, we're a community, all of us as lawyers. We may have different clients. We may be adverse to each other on a specific case, but we're all attorneys or in the legal profession trying to do our best uh, to represent our clients and to represent ourselves as best as possible. So I don't know everything. And uh, I just share what I think is helpful, but a lot of you will have information that may be helpful. If you have that information or you can address a question or if you have a comment, put that in the Q&A in the comments so everybody can see it. I appreciate that as well. All right. Okay. So there's two types of witnesses you're going to be. There's either the lay witness. A lay witness is a non-professional who's someone who's not getting paid to testify. Uh, it's, you know, it's the driver in a car accident case. It's the friend of the defendant or the plaintiff or a family member. Um, those are the lay witnesses. Uh, an expert witness is someone that is brought in, either a, a physician, a treating physician in a medical malpractice case. It could be a liability medical expert. Uh, it could be an engineer, a biomechanical engineer, an economist. Uh, there's so many types of experts that we use in litigation, uh, and those are witnesses that are usually a little bit more challenging to question. Uh, but with the right preparation, it's not a problem. Okay? So you're going to think about which witness it is, uh, first of all, to help you in your preparation, lay or expert. And then you're going to ask yourself in the preparation process, what do I want from this witness? What apples do I want to get? What do I want to be able to talk about in my summation that I want to pull out of this witness's testimony? Is this the witness that's going to hurt my case that I need to cut at the knees somehow or discredit or show that whatever they're attempting to say is just a bunch of nonsense and highlight that to the jury so they can't hurt the case? Could this witness, even if it's a witness for your adversary, maybe the witness can help your case. Maybe there's things that you can draw out nice and easy uh, from that witness on cross-examination. Most of the time, it's a mix of both. You usually can get things that can help your case and draw those out, and you can cut them down on the things that they may have said in direct to hurt your case, all right? And again, you're going to want to get these apples for your summation basket. So think about, have a plan for what you want with your witness. And then get to the transcripts. Let's talk about digesting transcripts. Now, in criminal cases, for those of you that are defense lawyers, criminal defense, or uh, prosecutors, um, that's not what I do, but my understanding is is you don't have pretrial depositions, and it's all off the cuff as far as questioning without the benefit of prior sworn testimony to use to prepare. Uh, in civil cases, uh, you generally will have pretrial deposition testimony and transcripts to use to prepare. You'll certainly have it of all the main witnesses in the case. Um, experts usually are not deposed in civil cases unless you're in federal court, in which case they are, and you will have those transcripts. Um, so whatever it is, you want to gather one or more of the transcripts for the witness. When it's an expert witness, you're going to do your research uh, and see if you can get transcripts from other cases. 
lawyers are usually pretty cool about sharing transcripts, uh, especially if you're on the same side of the case. So if another plaintiff's lawyer reaches out to me and says, oh, the defense, they're calling William Head again, this, this you know, doctor who does the independent medical examinations, who's been doing it for, you know, 30 years and, uh, you know, do you have any transcripts? I say, sure, I'll give you all my transcripts. So a lot of these experts that are out there for one side or the other, um, if you reach out, you do your homework, you call up the lawyers uh, that are affiliated with the case that may have done the cross-examination of that expert, uh, usually everyone's pretty happy to share transcripts. So get those because you can always get really good tidbits, especially if they're testifying in your case uh, on something that the uh, same you know, specific subject matter they previously testified on. Uh, you can get some good tidbits to use for your cross-examination. So get the transcripts. Then what I like to do is I like to use a yellow legal pad to digest my transcripts. Some people like to type uh, or, you know, use whatever they want. For me, I get out the good old fashioned legal pad. And what I like to do is go through the transcript and I write down a page and line number in the left column of my legal pad and then a statement from the transcript on the right. And I'm going to share my screen with you and show you what I mean by that. All right, so Michelle, let me know if you're not seeing it, but hopefully everyone's seeing my screen now. And what I have up here is an example of, um, of a digesting of a transcript, okay? And what you'll see here is I put at the top, it's a train operator in a subway accident case, and the date of the deposition is November 20th, 2014. And what I do is I'll sit there on my couch with my yellow pad and some red pens and uh, the transcript, it's a uh, pretty mindless work. You can do it while the TV's on, you're watching a football game, but it's really important to get done. And what you'll do is you'll see here on the left side, under page, I have two colon five. That means it's page two, line five of the transcript, where below I have three colon 10, page three, line 10, three colon 18, dash 25, page three, lines 18 through 25. Now, sometimes I'll paraphrase or I'll summarize. So the three colon 18 to 25, obviously there was testimony, some Q&A, where it came about in the, in the response from this train operator that he was aware that people can fall on the tracks uh, for various other reasons beyond the tracks, okay? And I'll go through the transcript, and if there's a really good statement, you know, in the transcript that you know you want to highlight, uh, saying, um, I, I, I don't know what color the traffic light was, um, whatever it may be, what I like to do is I underline it in red. If it's a quote, sometimes I'll put quotes around it. So what you can see here on this page of my digesting, I've underlined that um, this train operator saw my client on the tracks and thought it was garbage in the middle of the platform, not a person. Uh, that he was three car lengths away when he first saw what he thought was garbage on the tracks when in fact is actually uh, my client uh, passed out on the tracks, um, that he was one car length away when he put the brakes into emergency. So what I'll do is whether it's uh, a train operator or a driver of a car or whatever the subject matter is, I will do this through the whole transcript and I'll usually have a lot of legal pages of it. Um, so I'm just showing you one page as an example, but I'll go through a 300 page transcript and multiple legal pages of digesting it. And it's really important to have this digest. This is a foundation of building your cross-examination and preparing because it's basically like an index. It'll tell you where all the good stuff is um, and how to get to it quickly. And the process of going through this and underlining things and circling things or starring things, whatever works for you, you'll be able to start picturing this on the page. And you're up there and you're going to know three car lanes away. You're going to remember that was there. You're going to look at this digest if you need to, and you'll bring it with you to trial. And you'll see, oh, this was at 15 colon two. You're going to know where everything is, which is going to be important for impeachment. So you're going to digest any transcript and every transcript you have on a lay witness or an expert witness prior to preparing your outline. Okay. And um, that is my uh, sample for that. Let me stop sharing. Right. Then after you've gone ahead and you've done the digesting, then the next thing you could start to do is 
research the witness. Again, you want to get all the information down first before you start working on your outline and your point. You want to see what you've got on this witness. So after I digest the transcripts, I like to research the witness. Today, as we many of us know, it's really amazing the things we can find out about people online. I always Google a witness, no matter what, before cross-examining them. I always Google a witness before I conduct a deposition of that witness. Um, so you can look, you can just Google the person. You can look up the jury verdict reporter, which is a nationwide database where you can look up expert witnesses for sure. Um, you can look in, whether it's PACER, ELAW, or eCourts, or one of these online services, you can look up witnesses that way. Um, there's lots of ways. Go on Instagram now. I get some great stuff. I found out that two witnesses in a case I have now, it's a ski accident case, and they're two different patrollers and given different versions. And I was about to question one of them the night before I Googled her. And sure enough, I see her Instagram, which is public. And I see a guy next to her with her arm around him and kissing him and all that. And it's the other patroller. And I find out, oh, they're a couple. This makes sense now. So you never know what you can find. So it's really important to do it. And um, I'm going to tell you one little story. And it was on this train accident case where my client was intoxicated and fell on the tracks, where the defense uh, for the transit authority called in a toxicologist. And the toxicologist was from Florida. I figured it was a pretty heavy hitter. Uh, I looked up this curriculum vitae and saw a lot of credentials in there. And the night before I'm going to cross-examine this toxicologist, uh, I start doing some Google searching. And sure enough, I come across a document, a stipulation of settlement signed by this witness online. I was able to print it out with his signature. Uh, it was an agreement, a settlement with the attorney general's office saying, I hereby agree I will not practice toxicology in the state of New York for six years uh, as a result of some wrongdoing going on at this witness's lab. And now I knew why this witness was in Florida and being flown in. For the life of me, it must have just been uh, something that the defense overlooked or this witness didn't share with them. Uh, and so I printed out. I bring it to trial, and at the time of my cross-examination that I let loose on it, you know, the defense wasn't happy, the jurors' draws dropped. They said, oh, that's why you came in from Florida, because you're not licensed to practice in New York. Um, you got kicked out of New York, didn't you? But you're coming in here to testify? So um, you could always find, not always, but often find interesting stuff. So it's really important that you take a moment and, um, and do some research. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so once you gather all this information, as much as you can on the witness by digesting transcripts, prior testimony, doing research online, then you want to start thinking about the points that you want to make or the sections uh, that are going to touch on the areas that are important uh, for uh, getting the apples in your basket, for your evidence, for the collateral issues like showing this person's a higher gun and they're not really objective. Um, and you want to create, I usually suggest five to 10 sections or point headings for your outline of what you want to um, go over in your cross and the information you want to get. So, you know, what we call collateral issue uh, or collateral issues should be a section. And collateral is the, um, the fact that this toxicologist was kicked out in New York. Collateral is the fact that if you're cross-examining Dr. Head, you can show that he's probably made, you know, he's probably examined a hundred plus thousand people and made however much and millions of dollars and not one of them's ever been on behalf of a plaintiff. These are things that you want to have a section on. Uh, prior criminal convictions, prior lawsuits or accidents, whatever it is, collateral issues. Um, sometimes you don't need to go there, but if it's a witness who you've decided is going to attempt to hurt you, and usually that's going to be an expert called by the other side whose sole goal is to come in and rebut your case. Um, you're going to want to be able to highlight this isn't really an objective opinion you're giving. You're, and so you can't say it, but what you want to highlight, this is a hired gun. Um, I have attached in the materials for today, uh, you know, I like to talk about two cases primarily. One is a subway case because it's got lots of good um, things to talk about, the subway accident case, but also my last case on trial uh, before his honorable Samson uh, in Queens, the Amador case with the motorcycle and the car. And in that case, we had a biomechanical engineer 
uh, who was excellent, and we did all kinds of recreations and maps, and, and, and we were able to reconstruct the accident to, for our case. And in rebuttal, they brought in a biomechanical engineer. And I've given you in the materials my cross-examination of the defense biomechanical engineer. And I encourage you to uh, take a moment and read through it. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, but primarily, um, what I was trying to do is highlight that, although on his direct, he's trying to come across as a scientist and he is able to reconstruct how this happened. And at the end of the day, he didn't base anything on science. He didn't measure anything. He didn't do diagrams. Uh, and so I really went out of my way to undercut him and saying, you're not, you, you haven't based this, this isn't objective. And then I segued into saying, oh, and you're not really here objectively. You're here for defense counsel's law firm, right? Don't you do a lot of work for his firm? Objection, objection. And that's all fair game. It got overruled. And I brought out that, you know, he's reviewed 15 cases at trial and probably a hundred prior to trial for the same firm. And I get out how much he charged for the review and for testimony. And then I bring out, so it's fair to say you've made over $100,000 just from this law firm alone, right? And, you, and this jury, though, you, you want this jury to believe that your opinion without any measurements or diagrams or any of the other stuff that our expert provided to them, that that's just objective, that you're not here trying to make an argument. So um, you want to have sections of that. And you want to decide when you're going to use them in your outline. I generally try and save the collateral stuff for right after when the witness really has given me a hard time and not giving me a straight answer or, um, you know, thinks they made a point. You just, you, you hit them with it at the right time. So um, you, you do your outline. And for in the train case, uh, I'm going to give you an example of, you know, a couple of headings that I did and, and how I prepared it. And for your outline, you can type it, you can handwrite it out again on a legal pad, you can do it on loose leaf paper in a notebook if you'd like, um, however you find you work best. Again, I can't underscore enough that we all do things differently. We all process things differently. Just because I do something one way doesn't mean it's the right way. It's the way that works for me. Uh, some people like to have everything on a laptop. Some people like to have everything on pages all over. Okay, so whatever you do, you have to have an outline. It's going to be subject headings or sections or points at the top. Then below it, it's the points you want to make. And next to it, you're going to reference the page and line number of where you have the testimony of that witness uh, to bolster the point you want to make so you could be ready to impeach. And I'm going to show you um, what I mean by that. So let me share my screen again. Okay, so now I'm sharing my screen. And now I've already shown you how I do the digesting. And now here's a sample outline of three points, okay? And these three points that I would feel would be important to make, uh, one would be that this is an experienced operator. I use that to my benefit that you know people are gonna end up on the subway tracks. This is New York City, folks. You're actually trained to look out because people are drunk, because people do drugs, because people have heart attacks, uh, pass out, they slip, they fall, they get pushed. You know, don't you, that people get on the tracks and it doesn't matter why they're there, you have to be on the lookout for them. Whether they're there because they're drunk or they had a heart attack or someone pushed them, uh, you need to be on the lookout and you're actually trained for that, right? And I had that. So I'm going to do this whole section and I did it at trial with the train operator or actually their expert uh, in train operation. And these numbers to the side of that, that's from my digest. So I say five years as a train operator, two colon five, that's where I'll find it. And then I'll, my question will be, and sir, you are actually trained, to look for people on the track. Isn't that correct? And if the answer is different than that, I can impeach the witness because I know the answer is given that uh, to that question in that form on page three, line 10. And I'm going to say, you knew, in fact, you were trained to be on the lookout for people on the tracks. Isn't that correct, sir? And then if the witness gives me a hard time, I can impeach them. I can go right to page three, line 18 through 25. Okay. Then my next section, you're going fast, okay? Um, you entered at 30 miles an hour. You didn't know the speed limit, okay? 
uh, and you didn't stop when you first saw uh, something on the tracks. So here again, I'll say, and you saw something, didn't you? And you were three car lengths away when you first saw something, weren't you? And a car length is 60 feet. So that's 180 feet away you were, and you saw something with 180 feet of distance and time to stop. And again, if the witness says, well, I think I was closer, I was only 100 feet away, I have the page and line number uh, to impeach, all right? So you don't always have a page in line for everything you want to ask, but when it falls in that section, you want to walk them through the path, and down the path, down the road to where you know you can nail them with what they've previously testified to, okay? So that's the idea. You want to create these points, and they can be moved around. So if you want to bring the collateral stuff in earlier, you can do that. But if you know what each of your sections are, then when you're actually doing the questioning, the cross-examining, in your mind, if I'm doing these three points I want to hit, I know, all right, I'm on my first section, experienced operator. And I'm actually thinking about what I wrote out at the top of this page and these three points. Then I know I have a section on you didn't stop when you first saw something on the tracks. So it's a way you're training your mind. And a lot of trial work and a lot of the process of writing out things, whether you're writing out an outline or prepping or digesting or uh, writing out an opening or summation, it's the way your mind is sort of absorbing this material. And you really do absorb it through this process. So when you're at trial, you can do things and you could actually not have to keep looking at your outline. But if need be, and you're cross-examining and you're ready to move on to a new point, you take a break, you walk over to council table, take a sip of water, you look down at your outline, you see, all right, I'm ready to move on to section three, all right? Now, I'm gonna show you next, this is what it looks like when you have the digest and the outline next to it, all right? So basically what you're doing in cross-examination is you're taking a lot of the points that you already have, whether it's from a transcript or otherwise, and you know you're gonna be able to get out of the witness, and then you're flipping them into questions. So, for example, my question in the deposition at 15 colon two was, you know, how many car lanes away were you when you saw something on the track? And the answer is I was three car lanes away. At trial, I'm gonna turn that into my question. I'm gonna say, you were three car lanes away when you saw something, correct? And that way, that's getting into what we're gonna talk about with controlling the witness with leading questions. You're taking answers and information you know and you're flipping it into an assertion and having them agree with it, which they have to, or you're going to impeach them, all right? So you know the answer. You'll hear uh, many lawyers say you never want to ask a question that you don't know the answer to. Uh, and I would agree with that, but I would put, unless the answer doesn't really matter, and you're asking a question for the effect of it. Uh, but the idea with cross-examination is you're controlling the witness, by asking questions you know the answer to, uh, or uh, that you don't care what the answer is, that you want to make a point, and you're ready to impeach them if they don't draw drop in line with, with where you're going, all right? So that's, um, that's how you're going to set up the outline. Now, let me stop sharing my screen. All right. And then, now you have your outline, you have your sections, you know what you want for your summation basket, you know what points you want to make, uh, what to bring out that'll help you, what to bring out or undercut that'll hurt you, what collateral stuff you've got in your back pocket to really bring in at the right time as a zinger uh, to show the jury how you can discredit this witness. All right. So you have everything at the ready. And it's a little nerve wracking, right? Because cross-examination is going to be the first time at trial that you don't have total control. You can try to have as much control as possible. But if you think about it, certainly as a plaintiff, the way that the trial works for me is I give my opening statement, which I have total control of. The defendant will give their opening statement. And then I call my first witness and it's direct exam, which I've prepared as we spoke about in part three. And it's all seamless. It's all choreographed. It's all smooth and nice. And we elicit what we want. We know what's going to happen. Okay. Um, but when you start off with cross-examining a witness, you don't know what's going to happen. So usually the defense lawyer is the first one because they have to get up and cross-examine my witnesses, the plaintiff or whoever else I'm calling in my case in chief. And it's a little nerve wracking because you're not sure how they're going to respond. And 
you don't need to beat up on a witness or raise your voice or appear aggressive to be a good cross-examiner. I tried a case against a formidable adversary many, many years ago, and he was very soft-spoken. And he just stood at his podium and asked questions in a very soft-spoken, measured manner to elicit the answers that he wanted. They were tight questions. Uh, they were, he got what he wanted from my witness, and it was very, uh, it was very persuasive and effective. So you don't need to use your hands and raise your voice or, you know, appear aggressive just because it's cross-examination. Now, some witnesses, um, if they're just going to give it up, you're like, and you did this, right? Yes, sir. And you did that, right? Yes, sir. And you didn't, you didn't look wherever you were going. That's right, Mr. Smiley. You were completely at fault in this case, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you get some of these witnesses that um, they'll just, they'll just yes you and, and they'll just follow what you're saying. Um, you don't often get those, but sometimes you do. All right. Um, so prepare when you're preparing your witnesses for direct on cross, tell them, don't just agree because the lawyer's saying something, listen to the question, because we try and get into that mode where on cross, we can get the witness to sit and nod and sort of say, yes, that's correct. Yes, that's it. correct. That'll happen more often with lay witnesses. Expert witnesses are going to fight you to the point where they won't even just give you a straight answer. And a lot of professional experts, um, like the transcript that I gave you of the biomechanical engineer in the Amador case, um, they like to use different tricks so that they don't really have to answer your question. Um, one that this expert tried to use is, well, I can't answer that yes or no. I, I have to qualify it. That's a big thing. I need to qualify my answer. May I qualify? And I always say, no, you can't qualify it. You can answer my question and I'll ask it again. If you don't understand it, I'll rephrase it, but answer my question, please. And uh, you need to do that in depositions. I was just in a deposition uh, last week, two weeks ago. The witness was very cagey and she just wouldn't answer my question. She'd give long winded answers. And I'd say, you know, that wasn't my question though. Here's what I'm asking you. And then the defense lawyer starts saying, objection, asked an answer, the witness answered. You may not like their answer, but that's the answer. And don't back off. I say, no, they didn't answer my question and we'll read it back. And I'm gonna keep asking it until I get the answer I want. And that's how you have to feel when you're doing your cross-examination. You don't stop until you get the answer that you're looking for because otherwise you're bailing on your plan. You have to execute your plan. You have to know what you need and you have to get it, okay? So there are different ways to do that when you are actually doing the questioning. What I like to do as far as courtroom position is not stay at the back of the jury box like in direct examination, but get up in the grill, right up in their face, uh, in that sort of comfort zone or discomfort zone when I ask questions. I like to move forward and back. I don't want to be stuck behind a podium um, in direct examination. As the lawyer, you want to blend in. You want your witness to be the star. In cross-examination, you want the focus to be on the questions you're asking and on you and your incredulity. And you're looking at like, you know, they're talking nonsense. And let the jury see your disbelief uh, in how you're asking questions or doing things. And the way that you can do that is not by being stuck at a podium but it's by moving freely within the courtroom in the well. Uh, you can move a little closer. You can back up a little bit um, side to side, uh, but not staying still. And again, some judges will not allow you to do that, uh, but most will. So just ask, uh, we spoke about this in earlier parts in the series. You always wanna ask the judge what the rules are about being stuck at a podium or whether you can move around. And I do not like to be stuck at a podium on cross. My style is I talk with my hands. I'll be sarcastic. I'll look at the jury. Uh, and you'll get a sense of that if you read the transcript that's in the materials with this witness. And I'm saying, you didn't measure that, did you? And then he's like, well, I, I, I approximate. I'm like, well, approximating is science. You just told the jury it was 100 feet. But where's your measurement? Well, I did measure it. Well, where's a picture of it? Where's a picture of your ruler? Where's a notation that you took them? Well, it was approximately 100 feet. Well, approximate isn't science. We're here talking about science, right? And I'll look at the jury and, and you can kind of do that. And if it's not your comfort level in cross, you don't have to, but if you can and you feel comfortable with it, you want to change your tone, your inflection, 
uh, when you want to make a point, you can raise your voice a little bit. Come on. You know, uh, when a witness fights you really hard, this witness kept saying, can I qualify? Can I qualify? Say, no, sir, you can't qualify. I'd really appreciate you to add, answer the question so the jury can understand. You know, you can throw things like that. Let the jury see that you're an advocate for them trying to get to the truth. You know, it's not just that you're doing your, your job, but you're there to grill this witness for the benefit of the jury. And sometimes if you even know what's coming down in your opening, you can say something like, members of the jury, just want to give you a preview, a heads up. When I question their expert, I want you to, you know, pay a little extra attention when I get to the part about measurements. And let's see what we find out about that. You know, you can cue them up a little bit in opening, which is a lot of fun to do as well. So you're going to want to look at the jury. It's helpful to get uh, a little feedback. It's one of the few times during cross-examination. If you feel you're scoring some points, you can take a look over wherever the jury box is left or right. And some jurors you may see sitting there like, hmm, mm -mm -mm. sometimes they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, and sometimes they'll look at you like rolling their eyes. You get some good feedback that way. You don't know if it's true or not. I've had people smile at me that don't go my way, but um, cross-examination is the time to do that. So what I would recommend you do is you have your outline, um, you have your... Uh, Digest on council table or on the podium. You keep them next to each other. Then you question the witness with leading questions. That's how you control a witness, okay? Let's talk about controlling a witness. We spoke in part three about open questions and direct exam and non-leading questions because you're not allowed to lead your own witness. A leading question suggests the answer. You're not allowed to suggest an answer to your own witness. But on cross-examination, that's what you do. You never want to open up the floor. You never want to say, oh, and can you tell us what you did uh, in your evaluation of my client? Then that uh, expert physician is going to turn to the jury and uh, take it for 20 minutes to say, well, I'm very thorough, and I like to first review all the records, and I like to do this. You never want to hand the mic to them, basically. You want to keep the mic. You want to be in control. You never want to open it up to a witness or who's adverse to you to explain anything. And when they try and do, well, I want to explain, I want to explain, say, no, no, you answered my question. That's what direct redirect is for. We spoke about that last time. Their lawyer can get up and say, Mr. Smiley didn't want you to explain, but why don't you go ahead now and explain, okay? Um, and nine times out of 10, that redirect isn't done. So you just, you cut them off. You're in charge. And you ask leading questions. Isn't it true that? Wouldn't you agree that? Or you just make a statement and end it with correct. You're three car lengths away. Correct? All right. So you're always doing a closed question. That's how you keep control. Now, if the witness uh, isn't answering you in a straight answer, it gives a really long-winded answer, you can't cut them off. And I know it gets frustrating. That's, I think... I get asked that question probably more than any other question about on cross-examination is I ask a question and the witness just rambles on and on and on and they're not answering my question and the judge is getting frustrated and I'm getting frustrated and I feel like I can't get my answer. So what you need to do is you give it a couple of shots. So first, if it's a really long, lengthy answer that doesn't answer your question on cross you say, Mr. and Mrs. Witness, I appreciate that answer, but that wasn't an answer to my question. I'm, I'm asking you to please answer my question, which is as follows. Isn't it true that? And then if they go on and on and on, you say, again, you know, I, I, I understand your hesitancy to answer my question, but you need to answer my question, please. And can you do it in a yes or no? That's another way you could do it. Objection. You may get some objections from uh, your adversary. But it's fair game to ask a witness, can you answer this as a yes or no, please? And, um, and you know, you'll see in my transcript that Judge Sampson got involved because usually the judge will get annoyed as well when a witness is just not answering questions and not being straight and being cagey. And they'll say, can you answer the question as a yes or no, please? So what you do is you, you let them be a little long winded and then you ask them and say, and then you could always say, your honor. The witness clearly is not answering my question. I'd ask the witness to be instructed to please give a yes or no if they can. So you can do it that way also. Um, but you never want to lose control. Uh, and that's the way you, you, you regain control. Tight questions, 
and let the witness realize that if they start rambling on or asking to qualify answers, that's not going to happen while you're up there doing questioning. Okay. So you don't argue with the witness. Okay. You control the witness. You're never arguing. And the way you control the witness is by being prepared and asking them good questions that if they don't answer it appropriately, you're going to impeach them. All right. That's the ultimate smackdown is impeachment. And it's a lot of fun. You got to set it up right. And uh, if you do it right and you're prepared, it can be very effective. And all the digesting, the outlines with the page and line number, that's all the setup for an impeachment. So to impeach a witness, what you need to do is, first of all, you need to lock them into an answer. So when you saw uh, my outline, and I know I want to say, I want the witness to agree that the train operator was three car lengths away when he first saw something on the tracks. Now, if I'm at trial and I say, and you were three car lengths away when you saw something on the tracks, isn't that right? And the witness says, no, that's not right, sir. I'm going to say, you're saying you weren't three car lengths away? I'm not going to say how far yet. I'm going to lock them in because you want it locked down so that you can highlight the difference between the prior testimony. Then the witness will say, well, I'm not so sure. It could have been maybe one or two car lengths away. I'm saying, so you're saying you're not sure? You're not sure it could have been one or two car lengths away? Is that your testimony today? You lock them down. They say, yes, that's my testimony. It could have been one or two car lengths away. Now, I know, and you all know, because you've seen it in my digesting in my outline, that this witness testified under oath the year before trial that he saw it when there were three car lengths away. And that's important because the further away you are, the more time you have to break that train before it hits somebody, okay? Obviously, if the train's right up on them, it's too late. The train doesn't stop on a dime. The further away the train is, the stronger my case would be. So you had all this time, right? But you waited. You didn't, you didn't do what you're supposed to do when you see something on the tracks. You didn't break three car lengths away. You waited until you were, you were right there, one car length away. So then I lock the witness down with the inconsistent answer at trial. So the jury hears it. It's locked in. I'm making it very clear to the jury. I'm saying, that's your testimony today? Yes, it is. Your testimony, you were maybe one or two car lengths. That's right. Then you get into impeachment. Now, I'm going to go through the proper way to impeach a witness and the questions you need to ask and how to do it. And after I do it, um, Michelle and her team is going to drop these questions into the chat so you can see them. But don't drop it yet, Academy team, because I want to explain the purpose of it first. As when in part two, I talked about the questions you need to ask to get something into evidence. Similarly, when you're impeaching a witness, it doesn't have to be specific exact language, but the gist of the language has to be there. And here's the gist of what you're going to do in impeachment. The first thing you need to do is you need to establish that the witness, uh, through the witness, that that witness testified previously at a pretrial deposition. So the question is, after you lock them down, you take a deep breath, they've given their answer, you go, you grab, you look at your digest, ah, that's on page three, line five, you open it up, page three, line five, and you hold up the transcript, and you say, now, Mr. Operator, you testified at a deposition in this case previously, right? last year, June 20th, right? You recall that? Witness is saying, yeah, I do. And by the way, if the witness says no to any of these questions, you just stand up in court and say, I'd ask defense counsel to stipulate that the witness did testify on June 20th at a deposition. And then your adversary has to acknowledge it because that's it, okay? And if they don't, you show it to the judge and the judge will say it. So the first thing is you lock them in to acknowledge they took that deposition. Then you say, and you were asked questions like you're being asked questions in this courtroom today, and you gave answers, right? In fact, it was me. Sometimes you're the person who did the deposition. I'll say, you remember, I was the one. I asked you questions and you gave answers, yes. And then they say, yes. Then you're going to say, and your answers were truthful, right? Didn't you take an oath to tell the truth? You know, you could phrase it however. And you took an oath to tell the truth at the start of that deposition. Isn't that true? Yes. And you did tell the truth, yes? Under oath, yes, I did. And there was an attorney there representing you, right? You were there alone, lawyer sitting next to you, yes, right? And then after the deposition, you had a chance to review that transcript and make any changes, right? Answer is yes. Sometimes they have, sometimes they haven't. You better check that before you're 
when you're doing your digesting for any changes. But most likely they haven't changed it. And, um, and if they did, it wasn't a change for this question, all right? And then you say, now, do you recall being asked, and you didn't make any changes, did you? No, I didn't. Do you recall being asked the following questions and giving the following answers at that deposition? And then you have to identify for the court, the court reporter and your adversary. You say, your honor counsel, I'm now referring to the witness's deposition transcript from June 20th of last year, page three, line 15. Okay? This way, the jury sees what's going on. They get it because you've laid the groundwork. Then you read the question. Question. And you read it clearly, loudly, and slowly. So the witness, the jury, everyone hears. Question. How far away were you when you first saw something on the train track? Answer, and I always like to make it a little stronger, and this was your answer. Answer, I was three, and then I turn and I look at the jury. I was three car lengths away. Do you recall being asked that question and giving that answer? And, uh, and see what the witness says. They're usually like, oh, I may have, or I don't recall that. And if they don't recall it, then you say, your honor, I'd ask, uh, counsel to stipulate that that was a fair and accurate reading of the witness's answer under oath. And then, you know, and then the judge says, counsel, any objection? No, that was it. So you get it in and say, so a year ago under oath, closer to the time of the accident, you didn't hesitate. You didn't approximate. You said three car lights away. But now for the very first time, when I'm cross-examining you in front of this jury, you're now hedging and you're saying maybe one or two car lights away. That's what you just said. Isn't that right, sir? Okay. So that's how you do it. And now the academy, if you would, folks, just drop in those questions, the impeachment questions. Again, if you're going to do it, you don't have to do it exactly in those words, but you do have to get the gist out that they testified previously under oath, lawyer there, answered truthfully, and now it's been consistent. Now, if you're going to impeach, make sure you have something that's a direct contradiction. I see many attorneys try and impeach my witnesses or other witnesses in other trials where there's really not an inconsistent statement. So I'll be there. My witness will say, yeah, I, I walked to work that day. They'll say, oh, do you recall giving a deposition on this date? And they'll go through all the layers. And I'm like, I don't know where they're going. I've looked through this transcript. I know everything my client said. And then the answer will be, and your answer was, um, I walked to work, uh, but it was later that day uh, or something like that. And um, it's just not uh, there's nothing inconsistent and it just looks weak and the jury has no idea why you're doing it. So if you're going to impeach, make sure it's on something important and make sure it's strongly inconsistent and you've locked them down. And that way you're keeping them in control. And you could be sure as you're continuing on in the deposition, you can just, sometimes I'll get to a point where I have witnesses just not listening to me. I'll go to the transcript and I'll say, you know, do we need to look back at your transcript? You remember what you said? No, 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 I remember. You know, it's sort of like you're, you're waving it there. Um, if you're joining us via podcast, the second attendance verification code for today's CLE is POD463. Again, that's POD463. So now we've learned how to prepare, how to digest, how to identify points, do our research, do the collateral work, move around the courtroom, get a little bit comfortable, get your feet under you, feel comfortable with the the question and answer, how to do the inflections, how to check out the jury, cue them a little bit. And then, you know, when it's time to stop, stop. Don't just stand up there and ask more questions because you're feeling good. And you always want to end strong. Same thing with direct examination. Never end on an objection, sustained, okay? Um, you never want to ask a question, have there be an objection, have the judge sustain it and say, I have nothing further, unless you're really doing it for a point. You know, it's like a my cousin visit Vinny moment, you know, where, you know, they're saying, you know, uh, what did he say about, you know, do grits on your stove? Do you have magic grits? And, uh, you know, how many fingers? And, you know, if you just want to yell and scream or, or just make a point like you are not objecting, are you, sir? Uh, and you've already asked it too many times an objection, ask an answer. I mean, that's OK to end. But you really want to think about what your last question is going to be always on direct and on cross-examination. OK, so, you know, sometimes like in this one of this uh, train operator, I could have had as my last question, I could have said, 
You could have stopped the train earlier, but you didn't, correct? And that's a good question because, you know, there's nothing the witness is going to say. And then you end and you say, thank you. As in all examinations and all presentations, whether it's opening or closing, you want to end strong. You want to take a deep breath. You want to turn and walk confidently back to council table. Uh, even if the cross didn't go as great as you hoped it to, you want to appear strong because maybe the jury will think that it was good just because you look like you were doing a good job, even if substantively you didn't get everything you wanted to. Um, impressions are important, folks. So it's always always keep, in, keep that in mind that jurors are looking at you all the time, all right? So then you go back and then you sit down. And uh, hopefully you picked up a couple of tidbits uh, from, uh, from this last hour so that you can now go and take down your next witness. Uh, I'm gonna have some future series where we're talking about some specifics and specific experts, and I'll give you some ideas on some more advanced cross-examination techniques, but hopefully you got the foundation um, today uh, or reaffirm some things that you weren't so sure of today uh, for your next cross-examination, or at least like I said at the beginning, you can go take down your mother or mother-in-law with some really good questions uh, and, uh, and, and make your point that way. So let's get to the Q and A. I try and get through all this uh, as much as possible. You can always reach out to me Always shoot me an email, call me. I'm always happy to workshop and talk about things. So uh, I'm taking a look through the questions now. And uh, someone's saying, can you say the words you use to impeach from a prior transcript? I'm not sure what the question is, but hopefully I covered that um, when I talked about impeachment. Uh, and then someone's saying, do you, uh, do you take handwritten notes of the direct examination of the witness before you do a cross? That's a really good question. So obviously, before I get up to do my cross-examination and before you will get up to do your cross-examination, the witness is being questioned. You really want to pay attention, as in anything during a trial. When you're doing the question, and even when you're not doing the question, questioning of a witness, you, you want to stay focused because things happen. Witnesses say things, your own witness or your adversary's witness that you may not expect. So you want to make notes of that. And if they say something on direct, that you're like, what did they just say? That's not what, and you know, because you previously digested it, you may want to come out swinging right away and start off and say, I just heard you say on direct examination that you were one car length away when this happened and there was nothing you could have done. Was that your testimony? Do we all hear that right? And then you go right into impeachment. So it's important to take notes of things that come out on direct. Um, you don't, you shouldn't have your head down writing nonstop just things that you think need to be addressed in your cross. Uh, and again, be surgical about it. You don't want broad strokes. You want tight things that'll make a point, whether it's for collateral or substantive purposes. Um, all right, so someone's asking me, how do you deal with a situation where you're, you're trying to impeach a witness and they're like, well, I did say that, but what I really meant was, um, you know, and they try and get out of it. The key there is you really have to lock them down. So if you have a, if it's an unqualified answer, I'm three car lights away, and then you lock them into an unqualified answer at trial, uh, I was once two car lights, or even where they're not sure. Um, if you have a difference, sure, not sure, three car lights, one, as long as you lock it in and the witness says, well, in my prior deposition, maybe I didn't know. You just need to be prepared to say, oh, so you didn't say you weren't sure then. You were pretty clear. I just read your answer. You said three car lengths. And now you're saying that's not what you meant? Well, if that's not what you meant, why didn't you correct it on the errata sheet? Uh, why didn't you say something different in your you know, direct examination? Why didn't you explain that with your lawyer during a redirect examination? So don't let the witness get away with it. And again, that goes to don't impeach if on the prior answer in a deposition, if it's not a strong answer, if it's a little wishy-washy, and let's say the prior answer and the witness said, um, I'm not sure exactly. If I had to approximate, it might have been two or three. And then at trial, the witness says, I'm not sure. I'm thinking maybe two. That may not be a good cross. That may not be a good impeachment. Because then they'll say, yeah, like I said in my prior one, I wasn't sure it could have been two or three. And yeah, I said two, but it could have been two. So again, it all depends on how strong you can lock them in at their deposition and how strong you could pin them down on it to impeach them at trial. Part of the process uh, of cross-examining witnesses 
Um, and even if you've never done it before, but you do a lot of depositions, it's really important to read as many cross-examination transcripts as possible and try and get involved with your colleagues or partners or attorneys who are doing the trial. Because once you start cross-examining, you start to realize the importance of a good deposition, right? You start realizing the importance of having locked in answers so that you can have the benefit of good answers, good questions, eliciting important information to use at the time of impeachment. Um, one of my partners who will do a lot of depositions for our firm, and then I end up trying the case and I tell him how I nailed someone. He's like, yeah, that's because I got the good answer in my deposition. I'm like, yes, you did. You did a great job. And it set me up for a strong impeachment. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone saying when you impeach someone using the person's deposition, do you have to get the deposition introduced into evidence before you can refer to it? No, you do not. Deposition transcripts usually do not go into evidence and you can just read from it. And um, that's not a problem at all. Okay. Um, is my advice on cross-examination any different if it's a bench trial and not a jury trial? That's a great question. Most of the trials I've conducted have been jury trials. I have conducted several bench trials. That's usually been in the court of claims, uh, cases against the state of New York where there's no jurors. And I'll have a judge say to me, all right, Mr. Smiley, I get it. There's no jury here. Move on. Um, but I go right after him just like I would in front of a jury. Uh, you're trying to convince that judge who's the finder of fact as well as the law in a bench trial. And I would definitely, I would plan it and prepare it the exact same way. Uh, and I wouldn't stop going after him uh, unless the judge told me to move on. Okay. So um, uh, someone corrected me. It is not a podium. It is a lectern. Yeah. So I've been using the word improperly for 25, 26 years. I've talked about a podium, but I've just been corrected. It's apparently it is a lectern. Um, do I like to start my questions as a question to me here with, is it fair to say that? Uh, some trawlers don't like that. What do I think? I don't, I don't use that unless it's, um, if I really can't get the answer I want, I may say, it's fair to say though, isn't it? And then ask the question. Uh, I usually wouldn't make that my primary preface. Uh, I would say, you would agree that. Isn't it true that? I wouldn't say, isn't it fair to say that? That's kind of a little weaker, okay? Uh, but if you're not getting the answer, uh, from the witness that you want, and ultimately you have to maybe back up to say, but it's fair to say that you might get, you might need to do it. But I definitely wouldn't, I don't like to use that uh, to start off with, usually as a backup question. Now, when the witness has not executed this transcript, what must you say to enforce CPLR 3116? So what this question is referring to is witnesses are required to be sent the transcript of their deposition and they're required to sign it and send it back, fill out the errata page, which is where they could put the page in line and make their corrections. And then they send it back and you have it there. If a witness does not sign it, there's a CPLR provision that says it will be deemed to be accurate uh, if they don't sign. So you don't need to do anything when you're impeaching. You just do it. And then if your adversary says, oh, wait a second, you know, the witness didn't sign that. Um, they're just not going to look very strong doing that. And then you just cite the CPLR and, um, and then you go from there. So that's usually not a problem. I've never had that as a problem. So one's saying when, uh, when a witness denies reading and, deny, and denying the dep deposition transcript, uh, has, has he waived his right to do so prior to trial? I don't recall testifying to that. The bottom line is if you have a transcript and there is another lawyer there and it's been recorded, it's, it's coming in, you know, unless the, your adversary uh, has a very good argument to make that this is not actually the witness's testimony, then you'll have to deal with that. But otherwise, if it's a transcript and the court reporter took it down and it's got a date and a time, um, I don't see you having any problem uh, impeaching from that transcript ever. Okay. Let's see, I see a lot of stuff talking back and forth to each other in the Q&A, which is great. Um, all right, someone's asking me, uh, do I have an opinion in terms of presentation for purposes of cross-exam 
using a, proje a, a projector a TV to highlight inconsistent testimony on video, that type of thing. Um, I don't. So if, if um, first of all, you're not sure what's going to happen with the witness. They may give it up. So you may not have their prior testimony ready to highlight and blow up. But what I will do is uh, I will get the dailies, which is having the court reporter send you the transcripts by email every night at the end of trial. And uh, I will blow those up for summation. And I'll say, if you don't recall, I, I blew this up. So there's no mistaking what the witness said. And remember when I impeached that witness? Well, look here, I have the questions from the transcript and what the witness said. So I'll use it that way. I generally, for presentation purposes, don't like using exhibits with um, a witness on cross unless I need that exhibit to make a point. Uh, but if it's sort of collateral or their prior testimony, I don't. Anything to take the juror's eyes away from me grilling the witness and eliciting the information. You're losing a bit of control of that scene. Similarly, someone asked me about whether or not I was going to use a slideshow uh, or a PowerPoint in my presentation with you today. Uh, for those of you who have followed a lot of my CLE presentations, I usually don't even like to screen share. And I do, I actually have a PowerPoint uh, on cross-examinations and, and I thought about it, but I don't like to use them because I find that it's less engaging. Instead of you looking at me and hearing me uh, and listening and being engaged the way we are right now, um, if something's up on the screen, you're just gonna be sitting there and looking at it and reading it. And I don't wanna lose you. I wanna keep your focus right here. And so I don't like to show other things. Same way in cross-examining a witness. I want to keep it between me, the witness, and the jury, and I don't want to lose, lose that tightness about it, okay? So let's say when I talk about a car length, am I referring to a train car? Yes, we're talking about train car lengths there. Um, all right. Someone's agreeing with me. Thank you. They say, I agree with Andrew completely about doing the same thing with bench trials. Judges are people, too, and influenced by the same things. Thank you for agreeing with me. Um, is there a reason to object to someone asking for a full deposition transcript being introduced into evidence? Well, that depends on what's in the transcript. Now, if you go back to sort of deposition and discovery 101, um, you could pretty much ask anything at a deposition, and it doesn't mean that it is admissible at the time of trial, right? So if you agree to put a deposition transcript into evidence, you're agreeing to let all these answers go in that may not be appropriate. They may be hearsay, they may be not be probative, it may be prejudicial, there could be problems with it. So, um, you know, if it's an adversary, uh, and, and again, you wanna be able to cherry pick. So let's say I have a case where the defendant driver gives me a really good answer for my case on page 10, but then tries changing or qualifying it a little bit like later on at page 30, I'm gonna to wanna to focus on page 10's answer at trial and impeach. Uh, I don't want that transcript going into the jury and one juror happened to read, I'll say, oh, wait a second, I'm reading here on page 30. So I don't like putting transcripts in, I don't do it, I wouldn't do it. The only time that I think that it's appropriate really to do it is if a witness is unavailable or dies, um, then that's a basis to move the entire transcript in. And then sometimes you can have a witness get on the stand, someone from your office and even read the answers uh, while you ask the questions from the transcript. But no, my advice would be never put a full transcript into evidence. There's no reason to do so. And I don't see any benefit to doing that. Um, if I ask the witness if he had the opportunity to review the transcript and the witness says, no, isn't that deflating? Well, then you say, all right, so you never reviewed your transcript? The answer is no. Did the lawyer send it to you? Then you want to look and then you want to, you know, you want to have that letter that you sent. If it's a non-party witness, the letter you sent to them where it tells them to read it. And then you bring that out. And if you send it to their counsel, you want to say, well, I have here a letter. Do you see this? Are you saying your lawyer didn't give it to you and ask you to sign it? No, my lawyer never gave it to me. Okay. And then you'll show it to him and say, so do you deny you said this? Yeah, I deny I said that. And I would have changed it. Okay. I mean, you know, you have to be quick on your feet. You have to be prepared. You always want to have the paperwork transmitting the transcript to the defendant or to the witness's counsel or to the witness, uh, his or herself, if they're not party, you sent it to them for that purpose. Uh, 
Let's see. A cross question. The light was red, and the answer is I don't call. We have no reason to dispute the light was red. Isn't that true? Yeah, there's lots of ways to be curious, uh, to be clever with your questioning on cross-examination. And I'd encourage you, if the witness doesn't give you a right answer, say, well, you're not here to dispute that, are you? I'll do that with experts a lot. Um, you know, where a witness, I, I questioned in a federal case, uh, a physician who evaluated my client and disagreed with certain issues of causation. Uh, but then when I said, asked about where other things causally related, and the expert says, well, I don't have an opinion on that. And I said, well, I understand you don't have an opinion, but as you sit here today, do you have any reason to dispute that that's causally connected? Well, I was, I don't have an opinion on that. I understand you don't have an opinion, doctor. I'm asking is based on what you've reviewed in preparing for this case and evaluating my client and for this deposition, is there anything you see that gives you an opinion that would dispute that? You have to lock them down. They say, no, I, I don't have the basis to that. If they say yes, then you, you ask what the basis is. So you, you have to be ready for those situations. In a medical malpractice cross-examination, do I project the relevant portions of the medical records? Perhaps, yeah, perhaps I'll do that. Um, for example, if you have a case, um, let's say I have, I have a medical malpractice case pending right now, so I'm not going to talk about the details, but let's just say uh, one of the physicians in the hospital chart diagnosed a condition uh, that our client had, uh, and it's in the chart. And then it's our argument in this case that they, had, they identified it, but then ignored it and went on for the, for the remainder of the time my client was in the intensive care and didn't address that condition that one of the attendings put in the chart earlier on. And um, they're all trying to say, oh, well, they didn't mean that when they put that in and they backpedal. So in that situation, I'm going to put that up at trial. And I'm going to say, it's right there. It's typed right in, right there. You see it. You want the jury to see it. So if it's that type of situation, if there's something really pertinent, um, you want to throw that up there. So you're prepared for that. Again, every case is different. And lawyers like to present things differently. And sometimes you don't want to ruin your flow. Um, but if it's something that's pivotal in your case, then yes, sometimes you do want to have that up to, to question them. Uh, don't some judges tell you that you can't cut off a witness? Do you recommend moving to strike that portion as non-responsive? What about making a deal with a witness that you ask questions that could be answered yes or no, and if she can't answer yes or no, um, then they'll tell you, and you'll try and ask a different one. Um, I don't like that approach, uh, Lewis. Thank you for that question. Um, it's true. You should never cut off a witness. That's why, if you recall earlier, I said if the witness isn't giving you an answer, you sit there, and sometimes they're giving a really long-winded answer, and I'll like cross my arms, and I'll turn, and I'll roll my eyes, and I'll look at the jury and I'll sort of be a little dramatic about it, waiting, waiting, waiting. And I'll say, okay, thank you. You just gave a very long answer, but it wasn't answer to my question. Here was my question. So you try it that way. And then I don't like making deals. I, I don't like that style um, because you're not there to make deals with a witness. That's not your job. Your job is to answer questions, ask questions and get answers to it. So I wouldn't suggest saying, can we have an understanding that I'm going to ask a question and you're going to answer yes or no? And if you can't, you're going to let me know. I don't like that. Um, I think it's uh, maybe you can do it in a deposition. That's fine, but certainly not a trial. A trial, you're not making any deals with the witness. You're asking questions and you're getting the answers you want. And I think that's really the way that you need to approach that. <laughs> Someone asked a question in Southern New York. Do I have a general feeling as to whether I'd prefer to be in state or federal court representing plaintiffs? Ah, so maybe uh, you're, Michael, the person asking, you're, you're further upstate than my downstate colleagues. Um, that really doesn't have to do cross-exam, but I'm happy to answer that. Um, as far as whether I'd like to be in, in federal or state, uh, it depends on the case. I've talked about this. I've done a CLE. You can find it on the Academy uh, uh, website. Uh, with my good friend uh, Hadley Matarazzo uh, from Farachi Lang, and we talked about litigating a case in federal court and uh, litigating a personal injury case in federal court. And uh, in my How to Litigate a Personal Injury Case uh, series I did earlier this year, um, which you can find online as well, uh, we talked about jurisdiction and where to bring cases. And there are benefits to bringing some cases in federal court, 
but it has its disadvantages. So uh, happy to talk about that separately, but the short answer is I'm happy to go to federal court. I love being in federal court. It's tight. You get rulings fast. There's no messing around. Things move quickly. You get the discovery you're entitled to. You don't have to file 10 million motions and get blown off left and right. Judges' orders have teeth to them, um, but there are downsides as well. It's much more costly, uh, much more difficult. Um, so, you know, it depends on, on your case, whether it's worth it or not. But certainly if you have the right case, uh, I like to be in federal court. I hope that answers that question. Um, oh, do I move to strike non-responsive answers? I never really get why lawyers do that, to be honest. Um, you know, especially when you're at trial, uh, when, when the witness gives an answer, I move to strike as non-responsive. And the judge will say, the, that'll be stricken and the jury will disregard that. Um, you know, the jury's heard it, so they're not going to disregard it. Uh, but for appellate purposes, uh, I guess it's stricken, so it doesn't go up on appeal. I think I would only do that if it was really something nasty that came out uh, in an answer um, that really shouldn't be in the record for appellate review or hanging around for any other reason. I can't think of something about that, uh, but, um, you know, I would do it if you think it's really appropriate, but generally... You know, or, you know, the witness just really isn't giving an answer after a while. That is a technique you can use. Move to strike is non-responsive. You are taking a risk, though, that the judge may not strike it, in which case it looks like you've made a bad, you know, motion and that can interrupt your flow. The judge may say, no, I'm going to let the witness stand. And that can be a little deflating when you're in the middle of cross-examination. So I'd be cautious and uh, judicious with moving to strike things as being non-responsive. Uh, you know, someone saying if a jury asks for readback, they won't hear it again. So depending on what it is, just be careful uh, about what's going on there. All right, so I think I've gotten through most of the questions. Let me take a look here. I appreciate everybody's good questions and everybody hanging in there with me. Um, uh, this late, there's still over 600 of you staying in for the Q&A. So I really appreciate that. Uh, I love the fact that we can all be together as a community like this, talk about things. Um, the next part that we'll be talking about after the new year uh, is going to be on um, closing arguments. Uh, we've now got all the apples uh, from our directs, from our cross. We're going to be ready to prepare to move those pieces of, of apple around, put them in and bake up this pie to serve in our summation, tie it all in. Because sometimes when we do our cross examinations or we get bits of evidence in that way or our apples out, it may not make sense right away to the jurors. They might not pick up on the significance of something you've pulled out. Uh, but then the way you pull it all together for summation is really an art. And I love doing that. And I love the way to prepare and present a summation. It's really how you pull everything together. So it's something I'm looking forward to sharing with you after, uh, after New Year's Eve. Um, when we're all back here and ready to jump in and kick off the new year. Um, so I don't think I see any further questions. So at this point, um, I'm going to thank you all. I'm going to wish you a, a wonderful holiday season. We're at the end of, uh, we're at the beginning of December, at the end of this year. The next time we see each other will be 2022. I can't believe it. Uh, I look forward to wrapping up this How to Litigate series. I look forward to sharing with you the next series that will kick off right afterwards that we'll be doing uh, in 2022. And I thank you all for uh, being part of this. And uh, if you're listening on the podcast, thank you for listening. I'd ask that you share uh, the podcast and like it, give it a good rating so that other people can enjoy it as well. And I wish you all the best.